have a forum, and I want to welcome everyone, uh, and uh, thank you for coming. We, um, this is our third attempt to consider this uh, request for COAs, and uh, I think we will be able to act on it tonight. We had one delay because of lack of forum, and another delay because of hurricane. But tonight we're here and ready to go. Um, I would like to um, request that we amend our agenda so that we can approve the minutes of the August 28th meeting. Uh, all the commissions have received those minutes and to review them. So may I have a motion to amend the agenda? Whether the building, structure, site, tree, or object 
is one of the last remaining examples of its kind in the district. E, whether there are definite plans for use of the property if the proposed demolition is carried out, and what the effect of those plans on the character of the surrounding area would be. F, whether reasonable measures can be taken to save the building structure, site, tree, or object from collapse. And G, whether the building structure, site, tree, or object is capable of earning reasonable economic returns on its value. Section 6.2 also states, in considering a demolition request, the Historic Preservation Commission will consider plans for the site after demolition. Site development plans should be compatible with the historic district, end quote. Regarding the proposal for a hotel to be constructed, the guidelines addressing new construction in Chapter 5 state, Quote, the design of new buildings, often called infill development, should be evaluated for their impact on the district. New buildings should reflect their own time as well as the traditional building patterns in the historic district. These considerations should include not only the building, but also the site design and landscape treatment. End quote. The design concepts for new construction to be considered include building <coughs> orientation and setback, overall shape of the building, facade appearance, rhythm, fenestration, massing and form, scale and height, architectural and site elements, and materials. We've asked Mr. Parks to conduct our hearing tonight, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Parks. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, earlier this evening, Mr. Coleman, who is representing the applicant and I met, and we discussed some modest changes to the procedures. The, the procedures call for swearing under oath each of the witnesses. We each agree that that element would not be required this evening. Also, we uh, discussed item six, the summarization of the evidence at the conclusion of the presentations. Tonight's evidence is anticipated to be somewhat lengthy and detailed and not easily summarized. So each of us agreed that that summary would not take place this evening. So we have uh, thus modified the existing rules for this evening's presentation only. Mr. Holmes, would that be accurate? Yes, sir. Very good, thank you. The first item on our agenda is preliminary uh, statement summarizing the application. And I've asked Mr. Smith to do that. And he will also present simultaneously to that the staff recommendation with regard to this application. Thank you. I appreciate each of you being here this evening to take this matter into consideration. Thank you also to the public for coming. This is going to take me a few minutes, but I'll do my best to move through as quickly as I can. The applicant, Roberta Green Jarrett, seeks HPC approval of a certificate of appropriateness for demolition of a siding clad masonry structure with wood joists and flooring located at 20 Northeast Main Street, which is commonly known as the Butler Mini Mall of Piazza. The applicant has provided the following information about the building of the project. The pro their project summary says the project consists of both the Parks Building and the Butler Building properties as surveyed and shown on the site plan. The development consists of a hotel with 75 guest rooms with a fully enclosed parking deck and has a capacity of 76 cars. The project details they provide are four. The hotel, number one, the hotel will be approximately 29,300 square feet with an additional 14,080 square feet of parking. Number two, the total building with hotel and parking deck does not cover the entire property. It will cover approximately 70% of both properties, leaving approximately 30% for green space of which we have proposed 12 maple trees and grass. Parentheses, it is to be noted that the site plan shows two areas 
with 15 foot setbacks each at approximately 145 linear feet, with an additional 100 linear feet at 15 feet, and another area 66 linear feet at 15 feet. Close parentheses. Number three, the center section of the building facing East Main will be offset two feet. Parentheses toward East Main. Close parentheses from both ends of the building. Number four, all canopies on East Main will extend five feet to six feet. Resuming city's fast perspective. The proposed replacement extends beyond the limits of 24 East Main Street and also incorporates an adjacent parcel under common ownership of 40 East Main Street. 40 East Main Street contains a dilapidated, the standing wooden structure 80 to 110 years older than the subject building. 40 East Main Street was previously approved by City Council for demolition subject to conditions. The original application for COA approval in 2015 anticipated the rehabilitation of the Butler Mini Bowl and incorporation of it as a part of a small hotel, 36 rooms, fronting Main Street, with service parking to the rear. Only after approval of the initial demolition did the applicant present drawings for a larger hotel. The Payne Parks building remains standing. It can still be restored, preserved, modified, or demolished. If demolished, it should be replaced with a development suited to its location. The second version of 2016 assumed demolition of the Butler building for a 60-room building, but this question had not been and is only now before the HPC for action. It introduced a front elevation that is materially the same as the current version, but it sought several variances from the City Board of Zoning Appeals, including reduction in number and dimensions of required parking spaces. The third version of 2017 was informally shared with the HPC in July for comment, enlarged the hotel further to 75 rooms, and added two level deck parking to satisfy the city's parking requirements. requirements. Historically, three story or larger brick commercial buildings are rare in Georgia's downtowns. Typically, the largest brick buildings are the courthouse, schools, and churches found in county seat communities. Occasionally, these were portions of factories or mills. The largest buildings in North Georgia are found in historic railroad communities. Even then, the presence of a railroad was not a guarantee of the land values and investment needed for three store or larger buildings in the days before electric elevators and air conditioning. General factors to consider are consideration by the HPC of approval of a new hotel or any other use involving both parks and public park building sites and supported by zoning requires number one. Determination of suitability for demolition, that is, either denial or approval with conditions in addition to those required under the guidelines, or approval without conditions additional to those required under the guidelines. And only then, number two, determination of suitability of the exterior design elements of the proposed replacement structure, that is, either approval, approval with conditions, or denial. The city's guidelines do not have as a primary objective of maximizing the build building out the greatest degree possible at the expense of compatibility with surrounding buildings and the district as a whole. To the contrary, they exist to promote preservation of historic buildings, harmony with the district as new buildings are constructed, and an economically viable downtown historic district. These additional comments tonight are offered in advance of the HPC's consideration of the petition for demolition because the issue of a suitable replacement building compatible with the district is a related and integral component of the demolition consideration. Regardless of its proposed elevations or architectural features, we should not consider a replacement if its general form is infeasible for construction or would require variances beyond the authority provided. Instead, as part of considering the demolition, we should evaluate whether the proposed replacement structure could actually be built by the applicant in a manner consistent with the city's previously established and long-standing requirements. I apologize in talking in advance for the time that the rest of this memo may take, but I believe it is important that these comments be reflected in the record. Appl applicable regulations. Regulations of the city related to historic districts, buildings, and properties are a function of the city's zoning ordinance, historic preservation ordinance, rules of procedure for the Delonic and Historic Preservation Commission, Delonic and Historic District Design Guidelines, <laughs> and development regulations. These regulations are similar to those found in thousands of historic communities across the country and more than 100 in Georgia. The city's zoning ordinance has regulated buildings in its historic business district, commonly called the P3 district, 
since its adoption in 1979. Changes made by a new zoning ordinance of 1991 were relatively minor and remained in place. Many of the articles and sections of the zoning ordinance are generic and relate to all proposed uses of property. This includes Articles 1 through 7 and Articles 20 through 28. Articles 8 through 19 relate to the city's 11 zoning districts of property, including the two which fall under review by the HBC. These are the B3 historical district, business districts, specifically detailed in Article 16, and the CBD central <coughs> business district found in Article 17. The alteration of structures or new construction in these districts is further specifically detailed in Article 25, Historic Properties and Districts. Article 25 requires a design review by the Earth Preservation Commission in accordance with the Delonica Historic Preservation Ordinance and Commission's Rules of Procedure. As with any member of the public, the applicant has had the opportunity at any point in this process to apply for consideration of text change amendments to the zoning ordinance. No proposed change has been applied for or is otherwise underway by the applicant or others, so the ordinance is applied as written. The Historic Preservation Ordinance was adopted in 1998 and has had three revisions, the most recent of which was July 2, 2012. Rules of procedure for the Delonica Historic Preservation Commission were also adopted in 1998 and have been in practice since then. Design guidelines have been in use since 2000 and were most recently adopted in 2014. Development regulations for commercial and business for commercial and residential sites and subdivisions have been in place in Delonica since 2000. All of these documents are available from and have been maintained for several years on the city's website. These documents are available as searchable PDFs. Staff is available during normal business hours to answer questions by phone or meet with potential applicants to review application requirements. Properly submitted applications are given priority and scheduled for commission review. Staff has oriented the applicant's team several times as to the city's requirements. We remain willing and committed to facilitate understanding and compliance with standards required for this and other properties in the community. Heading, regulations as applied to the subject property. The subject property, 24 East Main Street, has been continuously zoned B3 since 1984, if not earlier. This is also the zoning of the adjacent parcel of 40 East Main Street, more commonly known as the Payne Park Store. Because of their location in the B3 district, both parcels are subject to the regulations described above. Commercial properties in other parts of the community are not part of the historic district, like along North Grove, Morrison Moor, and South Chesity, are not part of the B3 or CBD districts, and are commonly zoned B1 or B2. These are subject to similar but not identical requirements. Most notably, they are not subject to the Historic Preservation Ordinance or Guidelines. So-called by right permitted uses or conditionally permitted uses vary by district, and each district allows for a different range of accommodation and uses. In all cases, these uses are subject to the balance of the regulatory requirements. Hotels are allowed for uses in the B2, B3, and CBD districts. Only hotels in the B3 and CBD district are subject to HPC review. Heading, technical zoning issues of the proposal. The following comments relate to issues of non-compliance of the applicant's request with the city's zoning ordinance. These are in addition to concerns raised in the staff report of August 25, 2017, regarding the project in light of the historic district's design guidelines. These are important to consider because compliance with the zoning ordinance is mandatory, not discretionary. Compliance with the entirety of city development regulations is not addressed at this time because the new material remains complete and subject to change. <coughs> Proposed departures from the zoning ordinance are known as variances. Variances are not to be created by actions of an applicant. Consideration of zoning and variances is not the role of the HPC. It is the role of the Board of Zoning Appeals, and the HPC has no jurisdiction or authority to approve zoning variances. Please recall the earlier attempt by the applicant to secure, secure three variances when the proposal included the hotel being served by a surface parking lot. Those requests were to allow narrower spaces, provide for some of the required spaces on site, and to extend the building limits above the public right of way. None of these were considered by the HPC, and they were subsequently withdrawn. Section, heading section 604, off-street land loading spaces. The zoning ordinance is 16, section 1604, sorry. The zoning ordinance is section 604, requires off-street loading spaces for service trucks. The number of spaces required is a function of the size of the building. 
The larger the gross square footage of the building, the more off-street service truck spaces are required. A building less than 25,000 square feet requires one off-street loading space. A building of 43,380 square feet is proposed, which is almost twice the size required for one space. Even if the parking area of 14,080 square feet is ignored, and only the 29,300 square feet gross square feet of hotel use is considered, two off-street loading spaces are required. Only one is shown in the applicant's most recent drawing. This can be remedied by changing the drawing to reflect the second required space on the lower level of the deck. Staff would not recommend approval by the Board of Zoning Appeals for a variance to allow parked trucks to offload from adjoining East Main better not choice streets. Section 602, off-street parking. In the case of a hotel, one off-street parking space for each hotel room is required. In addition, one off-street parking space is required for every two employees working on the busiest shift. The application and drawings anticipate 75 rooms and 76 spaces. This would allow only two employees on the busiest shift. Three employees on the busiest shift would require two spaces, in addition to those required for the rooms, as would four employees. This is because when fractional parking spaces are involved, Full space is required. Two employees on the busiest shift does not seem reasonable or practical given the size of the hotel and particularly for the rate of room cleaning needed between checkout and check in. However, increasing the size of the parking deck or decreasing the number of rooms would resolve this current conflict. Section 603 Handicap Parking Requirements. Section 603 of the city's zoning ordinance requires accessible parking spaces based on the total number of spaces provided. For any number of total spaces between 76 and 100, that is above 75 and less than 101, four accessible spaces need to be provided. The applicant proposes three on the upper level of deck accessed from matters and none on the lower level of deck accessed from choice. The requirements of the federal 2010 ADA standards for accessible design have applied to all new construction since March 15, 2012. These require at least one wheelchair van lift accessible space for first six accessible spaces provided. The applicant proposes none. Sufficient room might or might not remain on deck for the correct number of type and size of spaces to be provided. City staff cannot readily determine this because the scale used to prepare the site plan drawing submitted in 29, 2017, sheet one, does not match the scale suggested by its notation that says one inch equals 20 feet or the scale that is provided on the drawings. Options include redrawing the spaces, increasing the size of the deck, or reducing the number of rooms to reduce the total number of all required off-street spaces, and thereby reducing the number of handicap spaces. Vertical clearance of van accessible spaces. Of greater concern is the applicant's most recent described intent of decreasing the distance between floors in the parking deck in or email correspondence of August 22nd and 23rd between the city manager and the applicant's representative, Mr. Roger Dubois. This is the most recent material received from the applicant regarding the intended building height. In response to a question by Mr. Schmidt about anticipated heights as measured from the fourth floor and a measure from Mr. Street, from Choice Street, Mr. Dubois responded, A, first floor parking, 8 foot 6 feet inches. B, second floor parking, 8 foot 6 inches. C, guest room floor, 9 feet. D, guest room floor, 9 feet. The total of these four heights is 35 feet, which Mr. Dubois also offered in response to a question of building height above Choice Street. Floor to floor heights, however, do not represent vertical clearance from floor to ceiling or underside of the floor structure above. Section 502 of the federal government's 2010 ADA standards for accessible design has required a minimum vertical clearance for van accessible spaces of 98 inches, that is 8 feet 2 inches, for new construction after March 15, 2000. Section 502.5 reads, vertical clearance, parking spaces for vans and access aisles and the vehicular route serving them shall provide a vertical clearance of 98 inches, 2,490 millimeters minimum. Floor to floor height of 8 feet 6 inches from the second floor of the first level of guest rooms would not provide a required clearance of 98 inches <coughs> from the deck entrance to the required van space unless the floor structure itself at the room level was only four inches thick. This does not seem feasible and the applicant has not demonstrated or provided other basis to show that it is. 
This is a federal standard. The city cannot waive or offer variance for vertical clearance for off street loading spaces. In a similar way, sufficient vertical clearance is required for the off street loading spaces required in section 604 and described above. The applicant's designer correctly dimensions the required footprint of the loading zone as 12 feet width by 60 feet length for the lower level parking deck on the plans of May 29, 2017, but fails to account for the height of the truck. Among other requirements, section 604 <coughs> states, quote, such loading and unloading space, unless otherwise adequately provided for, shall be an area of 12 feet by 60 feet with 14 feet, 14 foot height clearance, and shall be provided according to the following schedule. As previously noted, or noted above, Mr. DeVoy described an intended floor height for the first floor parking of 8 feet 6 inches, which is 5 feet 6 inches shorter than the minimum vertical clearance required, even when assuming no height for the required deck structure. Ignoring this issue at this point would create a need for a variance of the applicant's making, which staff cannot support or recommend. If the roof of the structure is to be 35 feet above Troy Street, as Mr. DeVoy's email suggests, a ramp down into the lower level parking will have to be created with sufficient clearance above to accommodate a vertical clearance of 14, foot, 14 feet for trucks entering at the building's entrance from Choice Street. This might be able to be accomplished by raising the second floor of parking and or stepping back the upper floors. The up elevations of May 29th provided by the applicant do not show this. Section 703, height limitations. As noted on page 30 of the staff report of August 25, 2017, notes on pages 2 and 4 of building height will comply with city ordinances of 34 foot 9 inches conflict with similar notes on pages 3 and 5 of the same document of, quote, building height will comply with city ordinances of 39 feet 4 inches. Both pairings of notes conflict with the scale drawings in the Bailey Associates Art Drawing Set which are marked as one eighth inch equals one foot, and are presumably correct as they are under seal but not signature of Mr. Bailey. Based on using an architect's scale and the city's method of determining height, the request seems to be for a building of 40 foot three inches. Not only would this require a variance the HPC can provide and cannot provide, it appears to create a need for a variance the Board of Zoning Appeals cannot provide either. It would require city council approval of a conditional use for height and even then, it appears to limit their authority to a maximum based on the existing building in the B3 district. Section 703 of the zoning ordinance reads as follows. Section 703, height limitations. No building or structure shall very after be erected, constructed, reconstructed, or altered, except as otherwise specifically exempted in this ordinance, to exceed the height of 35 feet, provided, however, that the governing body may permit buildings and structures to exceed these height limitations upon approval of a conditional use as specified in Article 27 of these regulations. Within the B3 the Historical Business District, no building or structure shall be erected to a height which is greater than the height of the existing building or structure with the height greatest height within said district. The height limitations established herein shall not apply to chimneys, smokestacks, church spirals and steeples, domes, black holes, public monuments, observation towers, water towers, non-commercial radio and television towers, electricity transmission towers, and utility poles, and similar structures. The quote, building or structure with the greatest height within said district, unquote, is the old courthouse, old museum, determined by recent survey to be 36.2 feet as measured in a manner consistent with the city's zoning ordinance. The maximum height of the entry district is thus 35 feet unless a conditional use is approved by the city council in which case the maximum can be 36.2 feet. Mr. Bailey's drawings of May 29, 2017, with a scale and calculated building height of 40.25 feet using the city's method, exceed both the 36.2 feet conditional option and 35 feet standard maximum. The notes on pages three and five of the drawing set do not match the drawings and would exceed the city's height limit. Only Mr. DeVoy's email response suggests a building of 35 feet or less. It does so in conflict with no known <coughs> clearances on both floors of parking and related reasonable assumptions about the structure. I'm soon to conclude. If one assumes for discussion's sake, one foot for flat roof assembly, eight feet upper room hall height, one foot for upper floor assembly, eight foot lower room hall height, eight foot two inches for upper level parking, 
one and a half feet for deck structure, 14 feet for lower level parking, and that the lower level of parking is built at the street grade of Choice Street. Suggested by Mr. Miller's email of August 23rd, the lower floor of parking would have to be 7 feet 8 inches below the current grade of Choice Street. This would require significant grade changes upon entrance to the deck and would likely place the structure lower than the city storm system of our choice. Despite earlier verbal representations of his intent to do so, Mr. Boy's email did not convey corrected drawings, nor has the city received anything since to resolve these issues before your consideration tonight of the matter. Um, there are a few other points, miscellaneous things dealing with section 714, section 2104, section 2110, section 2406. I'll place these on the internet uh, after the meeting tonight. Because further changes to the site plan will be needed to comply with the zoning ordinance, this memo does not attempt to review the city's requirements and its development range. Other conflicts may exist which have not been determined at this time. <clears throat> Recommendation. As desirable, desirable as it may be to have additional hotel rooms in the lobby room, in its downtown, or even on this site, unless and until the applicant provides drawings for a workable version of a proposed replacement building under the zoning ordinance, preferably without variances, or with a limited number of clearly identifiable reasonable variance requests, staff recommends denial of the COA for demolition and denial of the COA for proposed replacement. Additional information regarding spe specific references to the word hotel and the zoning ordinance is attached to the memo. Very good. We'll move now to Mr. Holmans for the presentation of the applicant's case. I have brought copies in a written form for members of the commission, and I will tell you that I will review some of the material and will defer to Mr. Du Bois for specific information, and will ask him to come up and present you with that information. May I approach? Before I get into my written materials, there are a couple of other items we wish to address. I would say that uh, well over half of what we just heard for an application that was filed in November, we just heard for the first time tonight, which has been consistent with what we have faced throughout this process. There was mention that there was an initial filing, and that dealt with the parks building. And at that time, that appeared to be the principal issue as opposed to this being the Butler building. At that time, when that was filed uh, for the demolition of the parks building and what may go behind it, the decision was made to meet with uh, HPC members two at a time, maybe one at a time, and with staff as opposed to in a meeting like this. Comments were made, and Mr. Bailey took those into account and would try to make changes, and then later, the applicant was criticized for making changes to the plans. Then the issue was brought up about, uh, and I've asked Roberta several times, do you ever remember anything about 30 or 36 rooms? She always understood that we were looking somewhere between 50 and 60 rooms for this hotel. In an effort to keep it smaller, we filed the variances that you just heard. Y'all didn't have to worry about that. Another board, just as y'all on a zoning board, and most of what you just heard dealt with zoning issues. And while I'm there, I would invite you to go to Mr. Schmidt's report from August the 25th, page 17 of 35, in which it is said, is a hotel allowed under the current zoning of the property? And he answered his own question, said yes, and clearly so. That's a zoning issue that's to be addressed by a, a board uh, other than this board. We appreciate the work y'all do, but the zoning issues have been resolved. Most of what you just heard dealt with building permit issues, specific technical requirements when you apply for a specific permit. We understand we've got to meet those. Mr. Boy is going to address these issues with you here tonight about the plans that they've proposed. 
But when we filed for that variance so we could go with the smaller building, which was the hue and cry from the community, can you make it smaller? We needed variances for parking. We were hit with a resounding no. So we're going to meet these zoning requirements. We're going to meet the requirements Mr. Schmidt just provided to you. But we were told no. In fact, the city council was voting before the issue was even brought to them. Before it was even before them we had presented. They had already made the motion to deny the variance request. So we're not asking. We're not going to pursue a variance request. We'll meet your zoning ordinances. We'll meet your uh, building regulations and your requirements. As to other procedural issues, I, I have to point these out to protect and preserve those issues, but we were, as it's been pointed out, Mr. Boyd went forward and submitted plans in May of 2017. Under your rules of procedure, you have 45 days to make a decision to, to rule on that. Mr. Du Bois was here July the 6th to go over and review the proposed plan. Y'all remember that. Uh, a lot of the information from here, there's been plenty of time from July the 6th to tonight's meeting to bring up a lot of the issues that were just raised, but they were not until tonight. But it's been substantially longer than 45 days, and we submit that he, he submitted the information timely, and under your rules of procedure, the, the certificate being requested should be approved. Secondly, and we appreciate all citizens who serve on board, we do. Uh, but Ms. Owens participated in this application since November and certainly since May and announced her recusal right before the meeting in August when we were to uh, have a decision or to take this up and we couldn't get a quorum. But your rules of procedure prohibit uh, commission members who have a conflict, which has been declared, from taking part in the hearing, consideration, or determination, not just making a decision. And we submit that it taints the entire process because, as y'all know, you went through this building for an inspection about sometime back in July, if I recall, and sometime in August, others went through before you had that meeting. And, and she was still participating then. And that's a matter that you'll just have to address, but we submit it affects the entire process and any report prepared before that day is impacted. And finally, the notice for tonight's meeting that was mailed stated that the meeting was gonna be on Thursday, September the 25th, as opposed to Monday the 25th. We acknowledge that was what was published in the paper, stated Monday, but the notice that was mailed said Thursday and we submit that all of those taint these proceedings and should allow the property owner to proceed. The, the changes to the uh, plan have come about based upon uh, comments that have been provided in an effort to work through to address those issues. And the building permit issues and the zoning issues are not under the jurisdiction or authority of this board applicant must comply with those. The seven criteria, and you, the chairwoman pointed this out, it's, it's the ordinance that says what the criteria that, we, that you are to consider for demolition. The first is the historic scenic or architectural significance of the building. Well, you can read all of the reports that were commissioned apparently on behalf of this commission for the experts to provide reports, you can read those. And what was historically, what was the architectural significance identified? Cement blocks. Now they use the phrase masonry units, but if you read the report, it's a cement block. It says that has a unique size. But if you look at the uh, your own guidelines, which I submit, you, you set them up that these are guidelines for the design of the building, not the size. But your guidelines discourages using concrete blocks for fences and walls. But yet we want to declare this concrete block so architecturally significant that we've got to preserve it? I submit no. There's nothing architecturally significant about this building. 
In fact, your guideline 4.7 that addresses brick and masonry, it references and displays bricks. And in fact, one of the photographs in guideline 4.7 says don't replace bricks with what amounts to a cement block. But I submit that would be an abuse of discretion to find that a cement block constitutes an architectural significant feature of this building. And furthermore, to just drive that point home, the reports provide that from 1904, I believe, 1902 or 1904 to 1947, this property set as a, as a field, a cabbage patch. And then this building with these cement blocks was built in 47. And it was so significant that then in 1985, the city allowed it to be covered over. And I submit that the building set with it being covered over the way that it sits today for about as long as you had the, the, what is now deemed architecturally significant cement blocks. But if we want to go back to what was historical about it, it would be a cabbage patch for the length of time that it sat vacant as described in the reports to you. The reason I point that out is that I don't want the first criteria, the historic scenic or architectural significance of this building weighs in favor of the demolition uh, being approved. Then the importance of the building to the ambiance of the district is number two. Again, the, the phrase that's used in the report provided to you is that this is an example of the simpler and understated vernacular structure, part of its history. But the balance of the city's reports regarding this factor reference, reference uses of the building that's much older, that were lost because of fire, and acknowledged the renovations approved by the city in 1985 that failed to provide ambience. The reports that you've received acknowledge that a thorough inspection has not been conducted by the experts that uh, the city has retained for that purpose. In contrast, Mr. Du Bois is going to go over in great detail with you the information that shows that there's a lack of importance of this building to the ambiance of the district. The third item. The difficulty or impossibility of reproducing a building because of its design, texture, material, detail, or unique location. Again, the only factor referenced by reports to the city, that the city commission addresses cement blocks, that should not be the controlling factor in rendering your decision. Item four, the, the city's reports don't even dispute that this building is not one of the last remaining examples of its kind in the neighborhood of the city. The fifth are their definite plans for the use of the property if the proposed demolition is carried out. Yes. Six, whether reasonable measures can be taken to save the building from collapse. Again, the contractors retained by the city acknowledge that the report doesn't contain the detail and they did not inspect with the detail to render that decision. They say it's based upon a visual survey of the portions of the building made available for the inspection and that no demolition, and by that I mean they didn't dig into the building to reveal existing conditions and that the authors of the report can in no way guarantee that all conditions were observed. That's their statement. In contrast, Mr. Boyd will tell you that reasonable measures cannot be taken to save this building from collapse. Seven, whether the building is capable of earning a reasonable economic return on its value. First, your guidelines that you follow, not the zoning, not approving building <coughs> permits, but your guidelines are not intended to restrict or limit construction in terms of use or size, they offer design guidance. The economic report submitted to the city or by the city on August 16 assumes rent rates that are higher than the reasonable rent rates within the Lonega rental market. And it makes no provision for the occupancy rate. In other words, when you, when you rent, you have a certain percentage that you have to build in when you're trying to come up with your value 
that there will be some vacancy rate or occupancy rate. That wasn't done. The analysis submitted by the uh, city retained experts failed to include expenses for property taxes, for annual repair, for maintenance, for cleaning, for painting, for repair service, for insurance, for pest control, and for trash removal. It failed to include an interest expense, a carrying cost that's borne by the owner. There's an analysis that's attached to my report that I provided you that Mr. Du Bois will go over with you in great detail, but it establishes that this building is not capable of earning a reasonable economic return on value. This report takes into account the land costs associated with where the land or where the building is located, which was not done by the expert retained by the city. One other item, this may be in the historic district, but this building should not qualify as a historic building. It doesn't meet the Section 3D criteria for designation of historic property. The city's preservation ordinance requires the applicant to meet the seven criteria we've just gone through. She meets those criteria, and we ask you to approve the COA to allow the demolition of this building. We ask you to approve the plans that Mr. Du Bois will review with you so that we can move this project forward. I will be here to answer any questions when Mr. Du Bois finishes his presentation. I thank you for your time. Right now, just one. Okay. Yes. Good evening. My name is Roger DeBoy. Uh, we met one time before. I want to thank you for being here and donating your time. I appreciate that. And I haven't heard my name said that many times in a long time. And I tell you, Bill, you know, I guess what I need to do tonight is, is really share the journey that I've had with you and how broken your system is. Everybody needs to be aware of what we've had to go through and the comments that you've had as we went through. What I'd like to do first is start talking about the demo of the other building. I'd like to start out with the, the consultant's reports that were given or retained by the city. And I'm going to go through them one by one specifically, if that's okay with you guys. First, we'll start out with the structural engineer. I think everybody's got a copy of this report. The first page, just generally telling the description of the building. I was on site when he did the, the tour, along with Bill and some other people. As we get to page two, there's some things I'd really like to point out. As he gets down in here, he describes the top part of the page of page two, basically the, the structure, the members, the size of the members, and so forth. If he goes down item one, the rear stair and porch have a number of indications of rotting materials in areas most exposed to the weather. The railings around level one, level two porch have failed and are not structurally adequate or co-compliant for the building. The stairs have been constructed bearing riser heights that do not comply with applicable code. Noticeable floor deflection occur at levels one and two in the building. Estimated deflection in certain areas varies from one to two inches. These deflections occur in the joists and in the major beams. Many of the beams in level one have been propped up in the basement area with timber posts. These posts are supported on concrete floor slab with no apparent foundation below. Openings in the level one floor framing has not been properly framed or supported. It could be determined from these observations whether any of the masonry walls or masonry piers have been grout filled. Foundations of the masonry walls or piers are unknown. At the front section of level two, a section of the building has been cantilevered out beyond the level of level one to level two wall and the framing pattern and support cannot be determined. 10, the posts supporting the canopy along the sidewall of the street level have not been properly maintained. Some posts are crocked, and some of the bases have been shifted, and they do not provide adequate support. There's one thing in here they talk about maintaining, and that's the columns in the front camp. The other thing, as, as Joey explained, 
he has not done a complete, thorough observation to understand what any of the concealed conditions of this structure really are and what shape it really is in. We go to page three or four. If you go to page three or four, it states in here clearly. Analysis of the level on beams and floor joists both indicate allowable live load of 30 pounds per square foot. At level two, we could only analyze the floor joists, which also indicated a live load of approximately 30 pounds per square foot. There's no apparent structural framing system or provision for the building to resist either loading or seismic loading. And he goes on to the report, and what that's saying is there's no shear. There's no shear. Shear is when the building goes like this. It's just a masonry box is what it is, and it's got a wood structure in the center. He goes on to say that that could be forgiven due, due to the period that it was built. It says right here, capacity, the, the exterior walls appear to only have lateral load resistance system. The capacity of the exterior walls is questionable. It is uncertain what code applicable to the structure of the building in the 40s. However, our library codes for the 50s, which could indicate live load for restaurants of 100, which now is currently at 30, per square foot and 75 pounds per square foot for retail space and 40 pounds per square foot for apartments. Second level is at 30, needs to be 40. First level is at 30, supposed to be at 75 and 100. That it is not. Then he goes on, the capacities are not available in any of these areas. The same specified live loads for current codes match the values quoted above. Based on site observations of the roof frame, it is doubtful that the 2x6 roof joist noted would support a live load of 20 pounds per square foot per code. Again, he doesn't know, but he doesn't think. It's doubtful that it could do the 20 pounds. You know, and, and down here at the bottom where it says, this is what's really frustrating with me, the second floor framing would be more difficult to reinforce, however, with the local building official's approval, an allowable live load of 30 pounds per square foot would probably be adequate for apartment or residential use. The key word here, the key word is, if the local building official's approval, if he approved the DDA from the 2012 IBC codes, then you possibly can do it. But the thing about it is, people don't realize your building inspector is indemnified by the municipality. It was adapted in 2014, the 2012 IBC code. It clearly states on the internet that the building inspector can make decisions, but he is indemnified from any liability. So who has to take that liability on? Does the homeowner got to take that? I mean, the landowner got to take that, that liability on? Or does the municipality have to take that liability on? because they employed the building inspector and they allowed him to do that. First of all, in the state of Georgia, a municipality cannot indemnify a landowner. They cannot do that. So, it goes back to the burden of the landowner. The landowner, and first of all, the building inspector, if it is a life safety issue, he more than likely is not going to weigh that requirement. He's not. So it comes back to this second floor, along with the first floor, the entire wood structure is going to have to be replaced. People don't understand. If you got down, and every one of you folks, I believe, went there, I know that Bill went there, and you go down that basement, there's 14 temporary posts between the beams because the floor in some areas is greater than one and two inch deflection. It goes like this. It is failing. What they did is they, they basically constructed it without any structural design, they, without any code. They did the best they knew how. But during the life of this building and the use of this building, it has failed. So what he's saying here, what, you're, what this structural engineer that's been hired by the city is saying that you have to now, you have to start at the basement. And you're going to have to put every 15 feet two 2 by 12s with supporting columns that you have to cut the concrete, put a new foundation and footing underneath, and you've got to do that all the way down the depth of the building, which is 80 feet. You have to do that in every section in between. 
That is four sections that you have to do. But now you've got the first floor and you're complying with code. But you haven't alleviated the problem of the uneven floor, just one to two inches. You've got to take that finished floor off. Unless you want to replace all the floor joists. Somehow you're going to have to level that floor. And that's not an easy task. And that's not an inexpensive task. But now we get to the second floor. The building inspector's not going to weigh that. You've got to have 40 pounds per square foot. So now I've got to duplicate what I did in the basement up on the second floor, which is the main floor, the first floor. It's right on Main Street. But if I do that, as he says, it would be quite difficult. <coughs> then I have my prime commercial space that's divided up into eight different sections. Or I have to go to the expense and basically do a span to carry that load up above. I'm still not done. My roof, it doesn't comply. He says, very doubtful. Do I have to replace all the roof or do I have to resupport all of it too? To me, it is just not even fathomable to go in there and try to resupport this, even though the consultants say that it can be repaired. Anything can be done, but it costs money. We go on to the next report, which is the whistle report, which has a lot of experience doing this. And he recommends completely renovating this building. He's against tearing it down. His report says, let's take it back the way it was. Let's take all the siding off. Let's take the whole front off. Let's go back to the block wall and let's paint it. Let's put the windows the way they were originally. And then that's good. But I'm going to tell you something right now. That's Main Street Block. The way they put that siding on is they furred it out. To put the furring strips on the block, they had to adhere it. They did with nail. When you pop those things off, you're going to have polka dots everywhere because you're going to have to patch it and it's not going to be the same texture. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty at all. But when he came up and he did, this is an exhibit A, this to his report, he did a financial analysis. And he said that this is a very good investment that, that should be done. He goes down, his first analysis is a million thirty-six thousand. If you put a restaurant, it's a million two. Our analysis was a million three. That's what it was. He goes on to say, in his exhibit B, this is a 13.24% return. Anything above 10% is great. I agree with you. If you can get 13.24% return, you're doing real good. But the thing is, he didn't take into consideration any of the expenses. All he took was his cost, and he basically, what he did is he divided it into a revenue component that he came up with and came up with 13.24%. His revenue component, he's saying that a one-bedroom apartment in downtown Galanica is going to get $900 a month. Plus, they're going to pay utilities. Two bedroom is going to be $1,350. I'm not from Dahlonega. So I reached out and I asked somebody that's got a lot of properties, Chesity Property Management. They have got 350 units throughout Lumpkin County. So I thought, well, you know, these guys don't know what the rates are. They come down and they say that. An upstairs one bedroom apartment will be $550 to $600. A two bedroom will be $750 to $800. And I thought, well, that's reasonable. And then he went on to say that the square footage for the commercial space would be somewhere around $10, but they still got to do build out. Now, in the Wetzel report, he basically says, why box? He's saying that you can get, you know, on a per square foot basis, you know, $14 a square foot per year on an annual basis as a white box. Your tenant's going to come in, they're going to spend $50,000, $60,000, $75,000 to finish it out, and that's what they're going to pay. They're going to pay, for 2,200 square feet, they're going to pay $30,000 annual. If you divided the floor, first floor into two spaces, each side would get $30,800. <coughs> to me, 
from what I've got and the information, and again, I'm not from Galanica, but from what I say is someone that is well-versed in what the rental rates are in this town, he's extremely high, extremely high. However, and I went ahead and got a gentleman who's been dealing with real estate for 45 years. That's all he does. He's a CPA. I asked him, I said, review that. Is that 13%? I need to know. Educate me. <laughs> he came down and basically says, the annual projected income of 37,200 made no provisions of occupancy rate. The typical rate using the type of estimate is 90%, which would adjust the rental income to 123,400. When the facility is 10% unoccupied, the, the, the landlord bears the expense for fixed costs of such utilities, alarm systems, and so forth. Additionally, there's no provisions for property tax, annual repair, maintenance, anything to do with painting, any utilities, any cost whatsoever. The largest expense outlay would be the interest on the construction loan. In the analysis that the whistle did, I guess somebody just gave him the money. There's interest to that. Whether it's your own money, you want paid for what you're investing in. There was no interest carry whatsoever. There's no utilities. There's no taxes. There's no insurance. There's no maintenance upkeep. He didn't factor that in to come up that 13%. None whatsoever. So, we went ahead and we used his revenue number. We didn't decrease it, except for the 10%, instead of saying that from the get-go, I'm going to be 100% occupied. And that's what he's saying. So we used his, we went to 90% occupancy, and we put an allocation in for all the expenses you have when you have a commercial property like this. The bottom line is, your investment at the 1,036,000 is 1.08%. That's what it is in reality. To me, that's not a financially equitable investment. We went ahead and I put an analysis together. This is done by me. I'm not a CPA. Bill, I want to make sure you know that. And I used the revenue based on the local realtor. His rental rates. His cost for commercial space. You follow me, Bill? Okay. As we come down, same expenses, it's a negative 2%. Now, what bothers me is the city had the opportunity to go out and get an expert. The city had an opportunity to, to, to basically dispute what my analysis was of a million three. They get a consultant that basically says a million 36 and a million two. Not that far off from what I had. I said from the very beginning, everybody questioned it, that it's not financially feasible to renovate and fix and save this building. We had every opportunity. They come back and they give us something that has absolutely nothing in there for the cost of bearing and investing in that asset. To me, that makes no sense whatsoever. As we go on, one thing that has not been brought up, it does in the report of the city structural engineer, there's water coming in, the, the wall, that's next to the city's building. And that water has got, you can go down there, most of you have seen it, it's got black mold. You can slip and bust your rear end on all over that floor. And it's prevalent. And it's prevalent when it doesn't rain, it's prevalent when it is raining, even more so. That's been going on ever since the city and county, who are partners in that building, decided to trap in the water that's in that 18-inch area between the two buildings. So you can understand what I'm saying. The Witzel report says, yeah, there's a problem there, but what you need to do is put a gutter between the two buildings. So now we're attaching two buildings. 
so you can trot that water out of there. The issue started when whoever decided to put this wall up against the Butler building on both sides and trap an 18 inch area of ground in where there's nowhere for the water to go. Now water management is the responsibility of the owner, the owner of the land. So you're saying, well the city must own all that land in there because they put that wall up there and they tied it on the Butler building. They don't. Part of it is Roberta's and part is the city's. That has been an issue forever and it's not been addressed properly. Now, my question to anybody here that's an expert, Mr. Whistle, anybody else, how are you going to waterproof that wall when you got access of only 18 inches to get in there? There's methods you can waterproof from the inside. But as it says in the structural report, it doesn't say that the solid grout filled masonry blocks are there. They're not. But if they are even, the water's still coming through. So even if you waterproof from the inside, and you didn't do anything on the outside, you didn't put a top cover up there, and the water keeps coming in, it's going to keep decaying eight foot of vertical height masonry wall, 80 foot long. That's not a little way. Absolutely not going to go away. You know, I'll end with this as it relates to the demo. And if it was financially feasible, I wouldn't be standing up here. If I thought that there was an income that was available in this city per, per square foot or per apartment for that building, there would be far greater than the investment to repair that building then I wouldn't be standing here saying what I'm saying. I'd say, go ahead and do it. I'd say, Roberta, you better get your money out. You better invest it. You better do it. But it's not there. You can get any expert you want in the entire United States to review this. And they will come up with the same analysis. It is not economically feasible. The building is went through its lifetime. It is worn out. It's not a maintenance issue. It is an issue of a building that was built when there was no codes, no structural engineer. The man did the best he knew how, but it's just worn out. It cannot, it cannot be saved and be financially economical. Two things. The historic scenic architectural significance of the building is not there. The importance of the building and the structure and site, there's nothing there. As even shown in Bill's report, if you read between the lines and go down the far right, you can see where he says that. And nine, whether the building structure, site, or tree or object is capable of earning a reasonable economic return. I don't think there's anybody in this room. If Roberta would sell you that building for $400,000, that you would take the direction of Bill and invest $1.2 million in it with the rental rates you can get here you won't make any money. You won't make any at all. It's not a sound investment. My recommendation is to basically the building be demoed and then hopefully a proof plan for something that's replacement. It's lived its life. It's done its service. It's time for it to go away. That's it for the demo. Let me go on with the rest. Yes. Yes. Okay. Phase two. This is where I get to talk to Bill. That's the chamber building. Everybody keeps saying how massive this building is. Here's an actual photo showing the Butler building and the chamber building. Here shows you 
the front of the chamber building. That's massive. Butler building's not massive. Right here it is. That's the exact actual photo of those two. What I want to talk about first is what Bill talked about, my name came up a bunch of times, was the height. Why did we not have any dimensions on those planes? Why were they on there? Why were they taking off? Well, let me think. Sat right at this table. Probably four or five times. With Chris and that gentleman right over there. I asked him, not once, several times, to give me the calculations on the height restrictions for this municipality. He didn't respond. Met him again. Met the city engineer here. He didn't respond. He says, 35 feet, Roger, 35 feet. I said, this is what we're going to do. We're not going for permit. I'm not going to spend $175,000 for a complete set of drawings with all the details on it. Let me just do this. Let me put on there. We will comply with city ordinance as relates to height 34.9. Okay? Now, one of those sheets, which he brought up, you get your time, basically stated 39.6, I believe, or something like that. It was transposed. The architect keep transposing. But we've said from day one at that point that we would comply with whatever the ordinance is. When it goes in for permit and you review it, if I can't build it within that ordinance, then I'm in trouble because I can't build it because I know you have to have a variance. So 34 nine is what we said. He said 35 feet. I kept asking. Well, give me the, 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 the dimensions of what the tallest building that we have to comply with. He said, Roger, it's really easy. He said, basically, you take the average of four sides. He yeah, said, so you said it's a gold museum, right? He goes, yeah, it's a gold museum. So, okay. Give me your calculations from your surveyor so I can see it. Couldn't do it. So, left the note on there. In about three weeks, four weeks after we submitted our application on May 28th, I'm driving through town. I see surveyors out there taking elevations. I stop and I talk to them. So, what are you doing? We're determining what the height is of the gold museum. I said, hmm. That's why he didn't have that information. They're just doing it now. So they did it. And now it comes back at 36.2. See, it was 35. We had the note on there for over three months. We will comply with the city ordinance. Never once did Bill say that was an issue or a problem. Until August the 23rd when he sent me an email. And what he was trying to do is trying to hook me on the 45-day rule. He wanted to know specific dimensions on three different streets in which we will specify and clarify all of your concerns as it relates to code, whether federal, state, or whatever, in a final set of plans that will be developed and submitted for your review. But we will comply with the height requirement. We will comply with that. You know, we're not going through a specific permit process here tonight. What's amazing is you sit there and you read that, and you're so specific. Where were you three months ago? Where were you at? We sat right here. To me, that's a broken process. That's a process that wastes my time. That's a process that wastes everybody here's time. Waste your time. That stuff I don't tolerate. You tell the truth, and you follow that path. You don't come back in and try to snooker somebody at the midnight hour about dimensions that you've known and you've had in your possession for over three months. Anyway, let me go on. Uh, yeah, please, and this was one point of seven that he cited. That's one of seven. You're wasting our time. All right, thank you, man. Appreciate yeah, you it. You can go on and on forever, man. Okay, huh? You go on and on forever. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it real quick right now. Okay. We need everybody to be quiet. Good. Okay, we'll go real quick. First of all, this is an elevation. How much longer do you think it'll be? Give me 10 minutes. This elevation is building right here. Right now, we got 34 feet, a little over 34 feet to the top of the curve of the wall. On this side here, this is a little bit higher, this is a little bit higher here. 
But as you can see, the elevation of the average basically is based on the gamble growth is at this point right here. We do not exceed the height of this building right here. We do not exceed that height. We do not exceed that height. We don't exceed the, the point of gamble was determined on the height of that building. We do not exceed it whatsoever. So this is the building we have right now. It's got three separate sections. All the windows are different. The headers are different. Its bricks are all three, three different brick colors. The parapet details are all separate. And they're all different also. This is the site plan, which we have, which Bill did accurately state. We've got the green space. We've got the landscape. There's nothing there really now. We do have it now. We do have some. The buildings are offset by two foot. As per the requirements, as far as the relationship to the frontage of Main Street, it is aligned with the chamber building and the other associated buildings on the front. This is the side elevation. We've made changes here for the request of the HPC. We filled in where the parking deck is with false windows so they can see it. In the back, we did something similar. We did false windows up here as per the request. And we did the same thing on the Park Street side. On the Park Street side. And you know, I, I can go through all of this, but we follow the guidelines. And you can look at the guidelines specifically as far as the materials we used, you know, as far as is, is, is changing and trying to replicate different architectural aspects in different buildings here in Dahlonega. And we've done that. We did it with the hall building. We did it with the jail. Uh, as far as the, 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 the windows themselves being lined up, we've done that. Uh, as far as size, this building here that we're doing, you have to understand, this is looking down Main Street, does not come any higher than the gambrel part of the roof. It comes right here. That's where it comes. It will not dominate. In fact, the chamber building will dominate our building, is what it will. So that's basically it. That's what I have. I appreciate your time. I'm sorry if I took too much time. Just have to get some things off my chest. Very good, Mr. Lovins. I'm, I'm thinking now we would take very short presentations from the three experts that were just mentioned. From who? From the three experts that were just mentioned. Very short uh, comments to the extent that we should make. If that's okay. If that was our presentation. The, the interest here of pushing through time when the criticism of the applicant that we've not provided the detail. Is, is somewhat baffling, but anyway, that's fine with us. Uh, we, we presented I show on it. 43 minutes. Yes, sir. But when people at the audience shout at my man trying to present the information, that's a little that's a little difficult. Anyway, we we have presented. You have. I, I didn't say you did. I said the people from the audience. I just didn't see any effort other than Mr. Boyd to stop. I think, you, I think we can move on. Yes, sir, we can. All right, very good. Uh, Mr. Curtis Whistle. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Curtis Switzel. I am the owner of Switzel Construction Services. I've been a general contractor since 1982. I've been doing historical restoration since 1983. Um, a lot of harsh words going around. We were asked to come look at the building to assess you know, could it be restored, not you know, and given an open choice of what could it be used for. We reviewed the building. We were given limited access to the building, not unlike any other building that is in somewhat of an occupied state. We were able to make observations. Uh, they were in line with you know, standards for the industry. They're not out of line for a 1947 building. It was a difficult time in history to build a building. Uh, yes, it didn't have a structural engineer. It was probably built by the man who owned it, or he hired someone local to build it. Historical reg regulations don't necessarily say we have to preserve all the pretty buildings. Every style has its place. This building is somewhat unique. 
It has a very unique shaped concrete block exterior. It may have been made on site. That's the only place we can imagine that the product came from. It had a very unique shape. It maintained that shape for 40 years. My recommendation was that it should revert back to that state because I think in 1987 a great cardinal sin was done to the building and the fact that it was changed to appear to be something entirely different than what it was built to be. One of your main rules of restoration is false history is not supposed to be represented. It was probably done on good advice, nonetheless bad advice. We do believe the building has lifespan. We do believe that it can be restored and it would take a total restoration. It could be done with existing building codes, the international code for existing buildings, um, and basic uh, renovation and restoration standards. Um, you know, I thought the best use of the building was as it had been used in the past. Restaurants are your highest return. Retail would be your second. Retail costs less. At the end of the day, the cost analysis comes out about the same. There seems to be a shortage of, of housing. Small apartments seem to be in demand, which seem to be a good use for the second floor. We used rental rates that were furnished you know, by the city. I'm not familiar with the rental rates in Delano. I am familiar with the rental rates in Clark County, Oakland County, and some of the smaller cities. We used rates that were actually below those rates. I'm also familiar with the city of Madison. I've built some one bedroom apartments, smaller than these, in the city, and they rented for greater amounts than we're stating here today. We did not allow for construction interest. I'll also point out, if you want to go through the analysis, that there is a 15% contingency built into those numbers. Those are compounded by fees. And we can reduce that number to 900000 worth of construction cost. That certainly makes up for construction interest. And usually you're, when you're renting to a commercial tenant, you do triple net. The tenant takes care of taxes, maintenance, and upkeep. You know, it's a war of words here. Um, don't intend to continue that war. We were asked to review the building. We did so. We came back with what we believe was a fair representation of a way to restore the building, regain it back to its original appearance, and it is what it is. No, it wasn't the classiest building in town. I don't see another one like it. I haven't seen another one like it in North Georgia. I'll answer any questions you'd like. Thank you. If you would, uh, we reserve those to the end of the presentation. Sir? We would reserve those to the end of the presentation. Okay. Mr. Kless, Rex Kless. Rex Kless. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Bennett and Kless. I've been with the firm for 50 years. And during that 50 years, I've done a lot of historical renovations. I've done a number of projects at the University of Georgia, including the old 1832 chapel, the President's House, and a number of other buildings up there. We <laughs> renovated the TRR Cobb building, moved it from uh, Stone Mountain to uh, Athens, and restored it as a museum. Uh, so I've, I've done a lot of re historical restoration buildings, and I'm currently doing the Fox Theater in Atlanta, which is nearly 100 years old. We were retained, I was retained, to look at this building and to render opinion as to whether it could be structurally restored and brought to a position where it could meet uh, the code with minor exceptions. The building currently does not meet uh, the International Building Code. The main floor is less than required and uh, but you see it's been used for 40 some odd years even in that weakened state so it gives you an opinion of 
the real structural capacity of Deborah Frank. Um, the second floor, if used for residential work, requires a 40 pounds per square foot live load. If um, you look at the framing that is currently there, it will render 30 pounds per square foot. Actually, if you analyze the loading of one 200 pound man every four and a half square feet or every five square feet, you get 30 pounds per square foot. And you're not going to get that kind of loading on the second floor if it's an apartment. I've run across a lot of buildings where you could not bring the building load up to meet uh, the IBC, but by presenting structural calculations to the local building inspector, even on the TRR Cobb building, it has been approved. So uh, I'm very familiar with operating in that now. I agree that the main floor really needs some renovation, and I recommended in my report additional beams front to back of the building in each, the middle of each span, and that more than doubles the capacity of the two bay floor joists. It will require beam and it will require post every 15 feet. And I don't believe in putting footings on the concrete slab because I have no idea what the concrete slab is. So I recommend that footings go under each post. Now the existing beams that are there um, have deflected noticeably and all have had a post put in the middle of the span. So those beams, those posts are at seven and a half feet on center all the way front and back of the building. I would recommend that those posts be removed, a foundation put in, and a new post put in. The posts can be jacked slightly, but taking that much deflection out is very, very difficult. Now the building has operated for some 40 years or so with that deflection, so I don't know whether it's all that objectionable or not. Uh, some of it could be done. I had limited, uh, I did not have the permission to remove any of the building materials in the building. I had to observe what I could see and through some small holes in the first floor ceiling, I could figure out the frame <coughs> of the second floor and through one very small little hole in the ceiling of the second floor, I could see the roof members. I don't know how they're framed. That's why I classified them as that. Once they're exposed, they may be okay, but I don't know that. Um, the building, um, the renovations that I recommended in my report would not require that this building be upgraded for earthquake or seismic loading. Chapter 34 of IBC uh, sets limits on what you can or cannot do, and we do not exceed any of those limits if the restoration that um, is done according to my report. So therefore, there needs to be nothing done for that. Um, it may be suitable to handle, it's handled the wind loads for a long time. So seismic loading probably would not be much in excess of that. So I wouldn't be concerned about it. The masonry units that we saw uh, are unique and unusual. And I went to the masonry associations to see if we could track down anywhere anybody made anything of those dimensions, and we could not do it. However, <coughs> as best as I could observe the building, the cracking in that masonry is very minor, so it has withstood any lateral loads quite well. I did not notice any excessive settlement anywhere in the building, so apparently the foundations that are there are fairly 
suitable. So, in my opinion, and I've done a lot of these buildings, it could be restored. 